Hi, good morning and welcome to the ZP um, webinar on um, wearable biosensors. So I've realized I better share my screen pretty quick so you can see that. And that said, I'm sharing my screen and I will um, essentially go forward with it. I'm just gonna make sure that I've got um, volume, which I do, good, okay, cool. All right, so where, welcome to this wearables um, webinar. Um, now we used to do this alongside um, point of care diagnostics, but we realized it was just too long and we were, or rather we were packing too much into too short a time. So we basically sort of spun it out. Um, so today we are going to talk about wearables. Um, I do have some tech in front of me when, when I say sort of talk about wearables. I may, I may just illustrate um, slightly what I mean by um, wearables. So I'll stop um, sharing my screen, that um, part of my screen for a second. I will talk about um, transdermal sensors. So these are um, not my products. These are the Abbott Freestyle Libre 2. The Abbott Freestyle Libre 2, along with Dexcom, Dexcom are sort of, you know, the, the two leading CGM sensors on the market. And um, I'll be talking about them and they happen to be transdermal. I will be talking about microneedles as well. Lots of people are interested in um, microneedles. And um, one of the attendees today um, was recently um, in the lab of Joseph Wang. So Joseph Wang does a lot of wearables down at UCSD. And um, so I will talk about um, microneedles as well. I'll also talk about implantables today. So um, we'll talk about transdermal sensors, um, transdermal sensors in terms of microneedles, um, sweat sensing, and also implantable sensors as well. And as I said, I've got some hardware and some um, demonstrations um, to run shortly. Um, as I say, we split this, um, we used to have a bit of a packed um, webinar where we did wearables and IVD in vitro diagnostics at the same time, but it's just too, I say, much to do um, both of those things um, at the same time. So we, we um, split this one out. With all that said, let me go forward a little bit faster and say today, yes, today we're going to very briefly introduce Zimmer and Peacock. Um, your time is very valuable. I don't want to spend all my all the time talking about ZP. Um, I will talk about trends in the market. Once upon a time, I would talk about trends in the market being, you know, decentralization from, you know, centralized testing to now distributed testing. With distributed testing, I would sort of describe as um, point of care IVD type testing. In fact, I'll bring this in. So this is a, um, if you can see my camera, this is a new type of potential stat. That's actually um, both the potential stat for lab work, um, for, um, but it's also a instrument for going to market in the IVD space, in vitro diagnostics. So along this um, direction of uh, miniaturization, IVDs there, and then it kind of got to this kind of size. So I'll hold this up to my camera as well. This is the kind of um, Abbott Freestyle Libre 2. The Abbott Freestyle Libre 3 is even smaller than this. Um, so then we got so small that we actually um, got to wearables. Um, I'll talk about the technology stack at Zimmer and Peacock. What I mean by the technology stack at Zimmer and Peacock is, you know, we do sensors, we do electronics, we do um, apps, and we do um, a cloud system called Julian. I'll demonstrate all that this afternoon. I'll talk about configurations of wearables. Um, so, you know, we'll talk about these transdermal sensors, these microneedles, these sweat sensors, and um, now implantables um, as well. And um, I've got a few case studies on this, so in one on implantables, one on microneedles, um, and then I think about three on what we call um, non-invasive glucose monitoring. Um, it's always important to kind of have a look back what's been done in the past, because it does prevent the... Um, if there's anything we can learn from the past, and including errors, we don't want to repeat those errors. So we do have to look backwards on occasions as well. But you do find that the human memory kind of extends back about 20 years. And after that, people have already forgotten or society's already forgotten. So some of the errors of the past are now recirculating back through um, again. I'll also use Apple as a case study as well. So the reason that we're here, I mean, at, at Zimmer and Peacock, the reason that we're here is because we're very strong into electrochemical um, biosensing. Um, I do think electrochemical modality, if you're talking about wearables, um, the main sort of techniques that I see are kind of um, sort of photonics or um, electrochemical. I mean, under that electrochemical ba um, bracket, I could also put um, field effect transistors as well. Um, but electrochemistry, let's say, electric has proven itself to be a commercially viable uh, mass production, mass marketable technology for measuring um, analytes associated with human health. And that's been proven really through the um, glucose strip. 
and the same very similar science then um has been translated into um these wearable sensors in fact um there was a company called therasense which is really there was a company in alameda california called therasense it's now part of um abbott um the ip behind therasense um came from a guy called adam heller so the first product that therasense actually put on the market was actually a glucose strip they were intending to put a cgm on the market but you know they did a they did what's called a pivot where pivot means they had to change plans quite quickly because th when they were doing this so this is around about 2000 they realized how hard wearables were they wanted to get to market so they actually went to market um with a blood glucose meter the reason i bring that up now is because the fundamental science that they that therasense and later on abbott bought the ip and bought the company that fundamental science um was then and is now used in Abbott's Freestyle Libre 2. So if you ever want to understand Abbott Freestyle Libre 2, read the papers from Adam Heller on osmium um, complexes. Um, so quick, quick, just to summarize what I've just said, it's electrochemistry, whether you're doing blood glucose monitoring or CGM, in the end, it's electrochemistry. And there's not that much difference in the science. And the story of Adam Heller and Therosense is possibly a um, example of that. This is ZP, we're at what's called an SME. Somebody said the other day, you're more of a medium than a small medium enterprise. So I agree, we're more of a medium enterprise. We've been around for a little while now. This is 10 years um, and we are ISO 3485. We do have standard products and we do sell a lot of technologies into the academic community. I won't say much more because um, you know time is valuable to you. This is what's going on in the market. If you, um, especially with COVID-19, this was definitely, this slide, the origins of this slide definitely predate COVID-19, but COVID-19 really did emphasize the point that during COVID-19, they realized, you know, it, it was more in the public domain that we couldn't have centralized testing. Um, in fact, people were very interested in decentralizing it. So many people work on, on this idea of, oh, I'm gonna have a benchtop system in the doctor's office. This can happen today. And in fact, there are technologies for it. Sometimes the reason that you don't have blood testing in, like, say, the doctor's office is really just the business model. You know, maybe the doctor doesn't want to own the equipment, doesn't want to run the equipment, even though it may bring some benefits. So it's not always the reason that something, you know, when you go to the doctor and the fact he doesn't draw your blood and test it there and then, it may not because the technology exists. It may be because the business model is not working correctly or there's not a business model for it. Um, this handheld device here is um, from a company called um, Epocal. It's these days um, owned by Siemens. I think the product itself is called Epoch. It's probably worth saying that the predecessor to this Epoch was the iStat. This handheld electrochemical system, iStat, came to market in about 1984. So I just want you to know that, you know, when we talk about, oh, I'm going to do microfluidics and I'm going to do a handheld device, you know, and, you know, yeah, 1984 was the first um, technology. The iStat's still on the market, by the way. It's mostly un unchanged since it was first released, actually, and that's a different conversation. Right, and then it became palm size. You know, so when I say palm size, I mean, I've got a glucose um, meter in front of me here. So I'll hold it up to the camera. You know, so now you're really shrinking down to, uh, and that's the power of probably of electrochemistry as well, actually, that you can, um, these electronics, anyone who's ever kind of, torn apart a glucose meter will understand that actually um you know and, and actually there's a coin battery in here so it's sort of you know 25 percent of this is actually all to do to a battery at the back of it so um small low cost electronics works really well or you can do electrochemistry on small low cost electronics and actually the electronics then have shrunken down even more substantially so you know to go from in some ways, you know, if you're doing an R&D project and you produce it like a glucose meter, you could argue that actually that was all very wearable. But of course, with Abbott, now that, you know, they've shrunk this right down. I don't want to in, imply that Abbott's any, in any way a ZP product, but it is a good illustrator of essentially what's an electrochemical cell. So we'll talk about the fiber in a bit. But in here, there's a battery, there's telemetry, there's analog front end, there's digital back end, and there's the sensor itself. Um and it all it's so we got to a point now where actually all this is sort of shrunk down to such a point that you can actually wear it but actually um i'll talk about a company called sensionics um i have a slide on them it's got to a point now where actually i thought oh well you know we, we've kind of finished now it's got wearable 
But then you've got Sensionics actually doing that. I think they may about have FDA approval for one for a one year implantable. So it's it's gone beyond the wearables now. It's actually gone into implantable. And I suspect that actually the race on implantable will probably be now long term. You know, that will, if you're going to implant something, in, it's going to have to run long term. And it's probably going to be size, you know, that the smaller you make it, the less invasive it will be. So, you know, if somebody was asking me, and now it's a good, you know, I'm asking myself an internal question, what's really going to happen in um, glucose monitoring? I would say minimally invasive. It would be wonderful to have non-invasive, but I think non-invasive is really challenging. Minimally invasive. So you know, when I say minimally invasive, I can take this this watch. It's got um, micro needles on it. So I can put, you know, I can just um, twist it onto my, or not twist it, I can put it onto my wrist. And at which point now I'm able to put these micro needles through my skin and into my body. So that's a future. And then I think for some applications, it's actually long term implantable as well. Right. Well, that said, let's go off this slide. I'm also keeping an eye on the time. So at ZP, we work in sort of essentially two domains. Um, rapid test. Rapid test could mean in vitro diagnostics. Oh, so I should say point of care, actually. IVD can also mean laboratory testing. Sorry. So I should say point of care diagnostics. I shouldn't just say IVD um, or wearables. So, you know. Uh, in fact, when I look at when I when I hold up this wearable and I hold up this IVD system or this potential stat, I keep using that term IVD. When I hold up this point of care device and this wearable, they're both using the same electronics. And that's the and we live in an amazing era, actually, where electrochemistry is kind of winning out, let's say, because actually the electronics have become um, so powerful. Uh, any kind of experiment that you could otherwise think about doing in the lab, you know, when I say that, you know, uh, amperometry, open circuit potentiometry, and penis spectroscopy, linear sweet voltammetry, cyclic voltammetry, square wave voltammetry, you could do that on a watch. I mean, it's, you know, we live in a, a, a pretty amazing time. So at ZP, we do have a technology stack, whether it's um, IV, whether it's point of care or whether it's wearable. We do have a lot of um, electrodes. We do have an app. Um, I appreciate that some of you who are here today came recently to a webinar we did on the translation of academic research. So I'm going to go a bit quicker on the app stuff because there are other webinars you could come to. And one of the attendees today has definitely seen this before. So I don't want to sort of be too repetitive on this. Um, and also this app is also working, is, there, is talking to the only, there's, there's one commercial cloud system for the receipt and for the receiving and turning electrochemical data into information, and that's called Julie. Um, and I will talk about Julie um, as well today. Um, there are some sister webinars with this. So if you're interested in point of care diagnostics, if you've got a choice and you're doing a grant, in that grant, I would have your main delivery being, being a point of care diagnostic. And then I would have your secondary deliverable, let's say, as a wearable sensor, because you can make a lot more pro, um, progress doing point of care diagnostics than you can do on wearables. Um, I was at a conference this week, IEEE Biosensors, and anyone who knew anything about wearables was talking about artifacts. When you've got something on your wrist like I am today, this is a wearable uh, microneedle system. Just moving your arm will put, you know, will put movement into that, into that system. You know, any kind of liquid movement will be a spike in your glucose signal, for example. And, you know, you've got a lot of data cleanup to be able to do. So whereas when you're doing um, point of care diagnostics, you kind of put a drop onto the end of um, this um, sensor, for example, at which point then you it's all very static, let's say. So you've removed a definite source of noise, but there's nothing more noisy than somebody running around in the real world. In fact, when you sometimes see data on wearable biosensors in papers, either the, the data was never gathered on an animal, that's the majority of the case. When it is gathered on an animal, by the way, the animal is anesthetized. And then you've got the best case where actually the animal's not anesthetized and it's running around. But I think that is such a small percentage of the data that's otherwise presented to you. Most of the data that's presented to you on um, mice, rat, pig, touch type studies, that animal is anesthetized. In fact, I do have some data on an animal in this webinar that's not anesthetized. 
Um, okay, so come if you're so interested in um, point of care diagnostics, um, come to this webinar. If you're interested in the translation of academic research, I think there's a big problem in academic research. Um, at Zimmer and Peacock, one of the kind of technology lines that we run is called um, screen printed electrodes. I really think that the quality of screen printed electrodes that are sold into the R&D market, when I, and it's the quality of reproducibility. Reproducibility is a kind of you know function of manufacturing. It's the reproducibility that's really holding back a lot of research. So if you're interested in that, then we do a webinar on that on the 21st of August. OK, and um, by the way, this is all recorded, so you'll get a recording of this later on. At ZP, we do have a cloud system called Julie. If you're so interested, this can receive electrochemical data and process electrochemical data. We do have videos online about Julie and um, it's free to open up an account. The reason I bring that up is because if you go to this URL and you register with your email and you create a password, those are your login credentials. So you go to this Julie, julie.zimmerpeacock.no, julie.zimmerpeacock.no, you register there, you create a, an account using your um, email and your and you create a password. We can't see your account. You're, when I say we can't see your account, we can't see into your account. It's protected by those credentials. Um, then if you install an app on your either Android or your iPhone, and I'll show you how to install that app, and you log into the app using your Julie credentials, the app is essentially a portal to Julie. So in the cloud, we've got Julie. One way of getting information to Julie is through an app, and I'll talk about the app in a minute. But in order to make the app and Julie work together, you have to log into the app using your Julie credentials. Right. So open a Julie account. Remember the password. Remember which email you used. Then you can do the next bit. The next bit that you would probably have to do is um, um, is scan this QR code. So if you scan this QR code, it will take you to the um, Play Store. And there you will be. This is if you've got an Android phone, by the way, if you've got an iOS phone, um, you'll scan a different QR code. So you scan this QR code, it takes you to the Play Store and there you can install the Sense It All app. And if you go, if you have a, a, um, an iPhone, then you can scan this QR code and this will take you to the Apple Store and you can install um, the, um, the app there. And it's called Sense It All. Um, at this point, um, whether you're using one of our watch technologies or whether you are using one of our point of care technologies, these um, these wearable technologies, these are really quite functioning potential stats. So if I want, so if I hold this app up to my camera, it says device connected. This app, and I'll just change, um, I'll just change um, screens for a second. This app is in Bluetooth connection, in this case, with this particular bit of hardware. So this will become significant in a minute because this app called Sense It All is in Bluetooth connection with the hardware and the hardware, or oh, it's really a potential stat, knows what to do because of the app. I'll go a bit quicker because one of the guys online today has, has seen this before and I'm kind of mindful of, of, um, of that. So now let me share my screen back with you for a second. Because I want to show you the um, so this is the QR code obviously here. Um, what I'm going to do now is I will um, just change cameras for a second. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan that QR code. So at the moment I've got the Sense It All app. I've got a little button on the Sense It All app. The little button will now allow me to scan a QR code. I've just scanned that QR code. My my phone now says amperometry. And then I'll just do another QR code. Open circuit potentiometry, so I'll just scan that. Yeah. So now it's open circuit potentiometry. So what I'm doing, what I'm demonstrating to you is that if you open up a Julia account and you install the um, Sense It All app on your phone and then you log into the Sense It All app using your Julia credentials, if you have some of our hardware, you can start driving the hardware to do different electrochemical measurements because this app is says device connected is in a Bluetooth connection with that hardware. So you go open circuit potentiometry, um, impedance spectroscopy, um, linear sweep voltammetry, um, cyclic voltammetry, and um, square wave voltammetry. 
So if you're doing small molecule, you may be doing square wave voltammetry. Cycle voltammetry is kind of useful, but maybe not so much as an analytical um, system. Linear sweep voltammetry. Um, if you're doing things like immunosensors, quite tough to do immunosensors. Though I did see some interesting work coming from, um, I want to say Northeastern University um, on um, wearable immunosensors. Um, sorry, and um, if you want to do um, things like ions, sodium, potassium, etc., pH, then you probably end up using potentiometry. And then if you're doing glucose, lactate, oxygen, maybe ketones, then you would end up um, using um, amperometry. So different modalities or different electrochemical methods for um, different um, analytes. Because of Julie, Julie is very powerful. We can actually process raw signals in the cloud and actually turn them into um, um, actual, let's say, analyte concentration. So if I just Google this, or not Google it, I've just scanned the glucose QR code. At this point, then that potential stat that I'm talking about is actually just become a glucose system. Now, what we're demonstrating here is the ability to, um, the ability really to be able to do electrochemical set tests in the lab. But the thing about doing electrochemical tests um, in the lab is you really finish with what's called TRL3, technology readiness level number three, which means so a proof of principle in the lab. And that's where most scientific papers finish. Whereas in fact, if you're using the Julie and the Sensei all platform, in fact, you can send all your raw data immediately to the cloud. The cloud will um, analyze your voltammetry, for example, use the calibration factors that you put into the cloud and send you a concentration back. So suddenly you went from TRL three to TRL five, six, seven, for example. So these are different QR codes. Now you can try these QR codes out by following this recording later on, opening up that Julie account, installing that app, log into that app using your Julie credentials, and then you can scan these QR codes and just actually get a sense of this. When I say a quick um, demo, I'll do a, I, I will um, just do a very quick um, demonstration. So maybe I'll stop um, sharing really quick. Like I say, I'm conscious that some of, for some of you, this is new. Some of you came to one of our webinars the other day, um, so I'm going to be a, a little bit respectful of that. So I'm sharing my um, screen, let's say. So at the moment, in fact, I'm just going to scan a um, QR code. Yep. So I scanned a QR code, which puts the um, the app, let's say, into the right mode. I'm just going to take the beautiful thing about electrochemistry is um, we don't need much sample. In fact, I was talking to somebody and they were like, oh, yeah, you know, we put 100 microliters on. I was like, wow, 100 microliters, you know, come on, it, it only takes 50. Just out of interest, a glucose strip can operate on 300 nanoliters of sample. I put the sample on like that. I'm just going to give the sample a name. So I'm just going to name it. The reason I'm naming this, this test is because I want to find it later on. Test one, done, go to assay start measurement so this what i'm running what i'm doing at the moment this is a fully functioning potential stat that we can actually you know do essentially laboratory experiments upon um, what i'm actually using here is a chili sensor but we do have screen printed electrodes that also um operate with it as well at the moment it's actually doing um cyclic voltammetry um and um yeah it's doing cyclic voltammetry but we, because the real users don't want to see cyclotamatry, um, I'll just do done there. And what it then does is actually sends um, essentially all the data um, to the cloud. So I'm just um, making sure that I've, um, yeah, here we go. Let's have a quick look. Yeah, beautiful. All right, sweet. So this isn't the world's best um, cyclotamatry, I must admit. Um, let me just do a quick share with you. Um, so what it's done is it sent the data to the cloud. Um, I've got the cycle of voltammetry here. I can hear, see here that actually it's um, it's the signal is actually quite small. But I've actually sent the voltammetry to the cloud. We've actually we've actually turned it in this case into micromolar. Um, so it's not just it's gone on, it's going looking for the peaks. So it's found the it's found the highest current in that window. So what I have here is I have a whole bunch of tools, which mean that this is scan one. This is scan two. And then I can do filtering, I can extract values, I can use calibration factors, and actually I can make a number which I can then return to the cloud. So 
imagine that if you normally wanted to do a, let's say, a sample, test that sample, record the electrochemical signal, turn that electrochemical signal then into meaningful numbers, you'd have effectively have to build a prototype and productize, and sorry, and do all of that um, engineering yourself. And in the end, actually, this potential stat actually will send the data to the cloud. And once you're in the once you're in the cloud, we can then use all these tools to process the signal, turn the signal, let's say, into a real um, number. So what I want to do now is um, I'm more mindful that um, you know, if you want to see a more in-depth um, demonstration on that, it's a different webinar. When I say a different webinar, um, it's our um, either our translation of academic research or it's all also what we call our sense it all um, webinar. I'm going to slightly change track now and get back to wearable biosensors. Right. OK, so Zimmer and Peacock, we've got a lot of experience in um, biosensors, you know, glucose, oxygen, lactate. I mean, um, things like creatinine are also becoming interesting now. I think the kind of big applications at the moment are diabetes, um, sports and wellness, and then a little bit less around, well, not less, but there's some interest also in, in dialysis patients um, as well. With that said, um, we live in a great moment, in fact, because, you know, the idea that you can do most electrochemical techniques um, on a potential stat these days, that's the, sort of the size of this finger, is a really incredible um, moment, let's say. And, and in fact, you know, we sell these, um, there's a little chip here, um, uh, which is very shielded from electromagnetic noise. That's something, that's in fact, something that we do sell on our website. The reason that we um, at ZP we're super interested in all these wearables is because actually there's a real pull from the market from it but you can do this wearables in many form factors you can here I've got a kind of mock-up of the skin where you've got the epidermis that's this sort of the outer layer of skin which is often made up of actual dead skin cells um, then you've got the dermis and then you've got the subcutaneous tissue so when we talk when I was talking earlier on about Abbott and Dexcom um, if we look at this Abbott uh, glucose meter it has this filament that's coming out of it. This filament is actually an electrochemical cell. It's got a working reference and counter on it. Um, and that is about seven millimeters long. And that goes, it's, they use an applicator. So I've got, I've got the applicator in front of me here. The applicator is quite a large you know, amount of material. There's a real spring in this. And this spring fires and essentially plunges um, the filament. They call it a filament. You could call it a wire. But it's a this is probably carbon fiber. I got a suspicion. They fire that through um, the skin, and um, it's left essentially behind. Now I can see what Abbott's doing here. They've actually got a very sticky patch here. So this this surface area is sticky, and it's all about really anchoring this sensor to the skin because they don't want it moving around because of the movement artifacts we talked about. So they have this big sticky patch that helps to kind of anchor the um, sensor in place. So that's the sort of state of the art today. Um, now, when I say state of the art, so you, I, I think one of the original papers on this was actually published in 1992. Um, I'll get his name for a second. Um, George Wilson, sorry, 1992, for, probably first published a paper on this. Um, and the paper that he published is amazingly similar to what Dexcom actually have. Um, now it's becoming microneedles. When I say becoming, um, I know some of you have had a recent trip um to UCSD University College of San Diego um in that neighborhood down there there's um, a spin out from Joseph Wang's lab um called BioLink BioLink were seven years this is about their 11th year I believe so they were sort of seven years in quite quiet mode and in the last four years they've raised 158 million US dollars it's really important to emphasize that point because so many people you know especially in academia are really interested in doing wearable biosensors but to do, let's say, robust wearable biosensors where somebody is ambulatory, you know, they're walking around wearing these things. That kind of project is like 158 million US dollars and um, well, more than, by the way, because I've got a suspicion that Dexcom, who are on the market, actually spent half a billion US dollars. Now, these days, Dexcom has been around for 20 years and actually they just had a quarter where their revenue was one billion US dollars. So that's why investors are interested. But in order to have a 
a quarter where they made one where they when they made or had a revenue of one billion US dollars. Twenty years ago, somebody actually invested half a billion US dollars. So it's been a you know, it's an invest. It, there's nothing wrong with that investment. It's been a good investment. But just to say these are the size of money that it would take to make an ambulatory sensor. Again, it's a repetition, but actually most of the data that you see on animal studies in the literature is on anesthetized animals. It's a really important point. And yeah. Um, so at ZP, we do have micro needles on the website. I want to be very, very clear. This technology that I'm holding up to this camera at the moment, this had 20 million US dollars spent on it. In fact, I'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, it's got 50 patents behind it. We only make this available to well-funded um, groups that genuinely have a business plan to get to market. You understand that 50 patents behind this, 50 patents will cost you more than a, probably more than 200,000 a year upkeep on the patents alone. Be very careful with patents. Um, there's a lot of push to, there's a push to um, patent technology, but unless you have a business plan to exploit it, what you're really going to end up doing is just spending a lot of fees, actually. Um, so we've also done some work at Zimmer and Peacock on um, sweat analysis, um, and I'll show you some work on that and also contrast it with Joseph Wang's work. It's not a contrast, actually. We, <laughs> we came to the same result. Um, and I'll also talk about implantable as well. Talk about implantable from ZP, and I'll talk about implantable from Sensionics um right so zp actually if people are interested in um wearable sensors we do actually have a sweat patch um, online that you can essentially purchase and it will allow you to construct these kind of microfluidics for sweat we do have a lot of electrodes we do have um electronics as well we've got something on the website i haven't overplayed it actually called um the single it's a terrible name the single purpose biosensor circuit. The single purpose biosensor circuit. Terrible name um, from Zimmer Peacock. Um, but it's a very small set of electronics that could be used in wearables. Um, right. Side note on electronics. Electronics got a lot smaller, but actually, the, uh, by diminishing the size in electronics, we haven't actually lost um, any kind of uh, performance. When you're doing low power electroanalytical work, the electronics don't need to be large in order to have good signal. If you're doing like batteries, et cetera, that might be a different matter, but we're talking about low power applications and shrinking the electronics hasn't lost anything in the signal. In fact, I think it's actually all got better. We at ZP, for example, we've, you know, I mentioned that transdermal micro needles, which is called minimally invasive, non-invasive, which you could call sweat um, and implantable. Now what we've done in sweat and um, we've in the, we've looked in, most of our work is actually in lactate and potassium measurement, though sodium is probably just as good as well. Um, you know, we've got these wearable electronics. We've got this microfluidic patch that we can put on the skin to collect sweat. And we've, in this case, connected it by Bluetooth um, to the computer. And, you know, we would, this is the data that we actually got. So we got a start here where somebody's on an exercise bike. There's a point at which this person perspires. And then there's a point at which um, the person was actually straining. And when you look at the strain, the, the lactate concentration kind of goes up. Um, so I think when somebody's really exercising, then the lactate can kind of come up to like 10 millimolar, for example. But there's this dip in the data. And I found this dip really interesting. I, and the first time I sort of, the nice thing about talking about your science to other people is that they give you an insight into your data. When I first mentioned this, somebody said, oh, it may be just an artifact of the microfluidics. You know, there's some sort of delay in the arrival of the lactate. And I thought, oh, yeah, fair comment, actually. And in fact, they may have a fair comment because, yeah. Um, but when I looked at the Joseph Wang um, paper, I actually saw the same dip. So his um, he shows current. I think if he was using the Julie Sensi All platform, actually, he could have displayed it as lactate, but he shows current. There's a dip in the data, and then it comes back up again. When I mentioned this to somebody who had a much stronger background in physiology than me, they mentioned glucagon around the liver. So essentially, sometimes when you're exercising, you can have a second wind. That's because you've actually got a secondary storage of energy. And so, in fact, you came slightly out of this anaerobic state back into an aerobic state because actually the liver was releasing um, glucagon, but it's a temporary fix. And we exactly the same, you know, where we had our um, our d dip, um, Joseph Wang got the same dip as well. So I just thought it was really curious. And I've actually seen it in other people's papers as well. So um, we're all telling the same story there.
I've got some case studies here on um, implantable sensors, microneedles, and non-invasive. I keep an eye on the time, so we've got time still, so I will um, move forward. So I'll talk about first about implantable. What's wonderful about electrochemistry, electrochemistry can be incredibly small. Um, in fact, this technology package that I'm showing here has probably had at least a million euros um, spent on it. It's very similar to that George Wilson. I mentioned a guy called George Wilson, a guy, a professor called George Wilson. In 1992, he did a paper on CGM, continuous glucose monitoring. Um, so our construction here of a, of a glucose monitor um, is very similar. The, this is the package in here. You've got some um, batteries, um, a telemeter transducer for sending out the data and the um, electronics as well. And this package actually gets implanted into fish. Um, this is the point, actually. So this fish, by the way, at this point is not dead. This fish has been anesthetized. Um, essentially, you know, how do I put it in it? Because I'm not a cl uh, clinician or a surgeon. It's been split open. And actually, we put the package into the fish. As I said, actually, these fish were then actually, they survived this operation. Um, people do this operation quite a lot, actually. So this is non-ambulatory um, animal data. And as I say, most Infant, most data you see in animal studies in the literature is definitely anesthetized animals. Um, so we've put the sensor in there. In fact, here what we have going on here is we have the glucose um, signal essentially low. And then there's a moment where this fish is actually fed and then the glucose essentially jumps up and then it starts to come down, you know, because your sort of glucose comes up, plateaus and then comes down over time. Now, We've put a sort of a, a, essentially a kind of best fit line through the data because the real data is actually really noisy up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And that is because whenever and I'll take um, let's take my microneedle system. So I've got my microneedles. I put it on in my watch. So my watch is really the potential stat. I put it on my wrist. I pull that into my skin. Um, and if I do that. My data, you know, if I do this, it's going to have that kind of artifact in it. Now, these kind of artifacts have what we call a very fast transient. So you can you can appreciate that. Actually, you can filter that kind of I want to say stuff. But the raw data can be very noisy. And actually, you know, I think people think very much about the sensor and the electronics. But once you start getting hold of the raw data, which most people don't get to, because, in fact, it's such a lift to really just to put this watch on my wrist has already had 20 million US dollars invested in it. It's such a lift that most people actually don't get to this point. Um, so these days we're actually broadening out a bit. So we're actually now implanting into um, the pigs. These pigs actually are not um, anesthetized either, but to get the best quality data, it's best done on, on anesthetized um, pigs. But pigs are used quite a lot in um, diabetes um, research. You can get essentially diabetic pigs. Now, the next piece of work I'm going to talk about is not our work. This is um, a human implantable from a company called Sensionics. If you've not heard of them, Google them. Um, Sensionics, I said earlier on that some of the biggest things I think now in CGM, continuous glucose monitoring, and maybe any continuous monitoring will actually be implanted. Um, so Sensionics have done it. So you can see here the size of their um, implantation. This is unusual because I... I would definitely suggest that the best modality for doing sensing in the um, in the implantables is actually electrochemical. They have actually done um, fluorescence. Um, so they the problem I have with this maybe with this fluorescence um, here is that I'm not entirely sure that really how um, specific um, this um, dye is. They they basically have a um, uh, fluorescence dye. The glucose binds with it. It disrupts the um, structure and the fluorescence is essentially quenched. The thing is with that, if I expect if I did some lab studies and I test it with maltose and fructose, I would actually also get a quenching as well. Um, now, this thing is implanted. Um, so I think it's a sort of fairly minor operation. Um, it does demand um, finger prick testing twice a day, which is a bit annoying because most diabetics will already test um, four times a day. So a um, bit of a problem that actually that's required. And I think um, it's leaving marks. So this is just stuff I've looked up on the Internet. I don't own these images. I'm only using for the really just for educational purposes. And I'll try and be quick with my usage of them. 
So these things are implanted, but then the sensor is essentially put into the body underneath the skin. Um, and then the injector is basically um, retracted. But I, we have a suspicion that the sensor is actually slightly migrating. It's kind of unfortunate. It's a sort of torpedo shape. So I got a suspicion it's migrating. Essentially, these lines are like tracks. You know, as this sensor kind of migrates through, it's kind of leaving these um, sort of tracks. Um, and then people are actually getting um, a little scar from it. I'm not sure if you could call it a scar or a blemish, but um, that is something that's happening. So it's probably when I said, you know, where, where will the real innovations come? Then probably in if you the smaller you can make this, then the smaller these kind of marks, in my opinion, could end up being. So if you're really trying to be cutting edge, then maybe implanted and maybe um, making it as tiny as you possibly can. If you do do it, please do it by electrochemistry with my because the glucose oxidase enzyme, for example, is really robust and really specific. Um, microneedles, so these, um, this is from ZP. Um, so at ZP, we've been working um, on microneedles since about probably 2018 on CGM. Just to be very clear, our business model is contract development, contract manufacturing. So when I talk about this, ZP, will ne you'll never go out and actually buy a ZP um, microneedle CGM. You will, you, we, you may be our technology, but it's going to market with other companies, a very well-funded um, companies. Um, so as I say, just to get to this stage has actually cost um, 20 million um, so far. And, you know, you've got to put that in perspective of, you know, BioLink, who um, are also doing a microneedle um, technology, have so far spent 158 million and probably will go on to have to raise a, um, possibly half a billion. But that half a billion number I've got is actually based on a raise that Dexcom did 20 years ago. But there's a bit of a balance these days. I think there's more tech available. So it's not you can't just assume it's going to cost more these days because actually there's more incumbent technology that BioLink can um, leverage. When Dexcom were doing this, they were pretty much um, pioneers. There's so been a lot of work on non-invasive. Before I jump into non-invasive, something I was facing a few months ago was so many people saying, oh, well, non-invasive is done. You can just get it on, on Amazon. And I think the FDA really put a statement out and said, look, you know, these non-invasive glucose monitoring claims are all over Amazon. You know, there's lots of watches out there. Um, but they were basically saying, if it doesn't pierce or break the skin, then the FDA is extremely doubtful um, about whether it's actually working. You know, they got, they've got to be careful with their language and I've got to be careful with my language as well. But the FDA, you can read their statement. These are, I think I just copied and pasted off this. They put a, I wouldn't know sure if I called it a press release, but a, co a comment about smartwatch applications where there was no piercing of the skin. They were very sort of doubtful about um, whether they actually um, worked. There's a bit of a history on this. We've got Cygnus, um, about 2000. We have Pentra, a company that not so many people have heard of. Um, and then another um, company that not everyone's heard of called Apple. We're also working on non-invasive um, glucose um, monitoring. I'll just grab an Apple watch, actually. Give me one sec. Um, I mean, I've read and studied the Apple patent um, and on the back of the Apple Watch, you've obviously got these LEDs and these LEDs are probably what they're trying to exploit um, in their IP position. But let's talk about Cygnus first of all. Everyone talks about the Gluco Watch. I'm not sure everyone really knows what it's about. Um, so I said 2000, it was approved by the FDA in 1999. So um, in fact, we're sort of 25 years now. So that's, you know, 25 years is you know, is, is basically half a career for most people, uh, more, more than half a career, in fact. Um, it took a reading every 20 minutes. I'll talk about that in a minute. It was worn for 12 hours. So just know that, you know, there are people working on what's called reverse iontophoresis. So this is kind of um, 12 hours was, a wet, was the wear time that Cygnus had got to. They had a warm up of three hours. So if you're working on reverse iontophoresis, just be aware that you know, at least for Cygnus in 1999, it's a three hour wear time. I do talk to people and they're like, in fact, I was talking to a gentleman two days ago who was interested in reverse anthophoresis. And it's like everyone has it. Oh, I've got these new ideas. I'm, yeah, I'm sure you do. But they put a lot of effort into this. You know, they and I know the guys behind this. They're not, you know, they're, they're fine scientists and engineers. Um, it did require calibration um, and um, it did have some negative reviews. So it was using a technique called reverse iontophoresis. Um, 
you have the skin you, underneath the skin in in the interstitial fluid you have something called glucose when um ab and dexcom are measuring glucose they're literally putting their um, electrochemical cell this fiber in the case of um or filament um directly into that interstitial fluid in the case of ab and dexcom with cygnus they were actually they were or they were actually trying to extract the glucose using a technique called um reverse autophoresis so they had some pretty big electrodes on the back of this watch i suppose it's not so dissimilar to what this is micro needle but i can see what was going on here they had a watch um on the back of it whereas i've got uh, micro needles they had some sort of electro patch um now the electro patch they were applying voltage and <clears throat> i'm sorry applying voltage in order to have a current but that current you know you don't pass electrons through the skin in the skin if you're passing a current through an external circuit you're going to end up having to shift ions um and those ions will probably end up being the bulk of which sodium and chloride <coughs> and so cygnus were sort of and sodium and chloride are probably dragging water with them and by dragging water with them you're also dragging glucose with it so i suspect that they had two circuits on this um, a circuit for the reverse autophoresis because that's going to have to apply a quite large voltage and um, carry quite high current and then a glucose circuit which is actually measuring the um, glucose itself they were a generation one glucose sensor this is not the webinar for generation um zp talking about generation one um, glucose sensors quite a bit um just out of interest um the internet seems to have forgotten but there used to be quite a lot of um images online about how this reverse anatophoresis would lead to quite some blisters on the skin you'll talk see talk people talking about burns and itchiness now the internet seems to have forgotten those images this is the best i could find um but um the reverse anatophoresis did lead to blistering and itchiness they had a bit of a duty cycle so they would apparently pass um they would apply a voltage um 0.3 to 1.5 volts they would pass a current density of about 0.3 milliamps per centimeter squared i have a suspicion that actually they were passing about 0.3 milliamps 0.3 milliamps is actually quite a lot of current so i got a suspicion that people may have had some sharp kind of small but noticeable sort of stinging off um off that um what they would do is they would um they would do an extraction for three minutes and then they would read for seven minutes. So they would sort of have this voltage applied. They would be passing this quite high current. They would be essentially dragging ions out, dragging water out and therefore dragging glucose out um, through the skin after the three hour warm up period. Um, and they would they would do that extraction for three minutes and then they would read for seven minutes and then they would reverse the polarity. So in fact, what they really had was two systems on here. One of them was active and the other one was in off. And then the other one was on and the other one was off. So they were cycling between two um, systems. Um, and during that seven minute read, they were basically just probably measuring the current and integrating it all that time. Now, the reason they were doing all that kind of integration of the current into charge and then apply and then turning the charge through a calibration into glucose is because I did read online um, that in fact, they think they were getting something like 50 pico molar of um, glucose which is a really low concentration in the interstitial fluid it's about five millimolar um so millimolar 10 to minus three pico molar um i hope i get this right 10 to minus 12 so i've sort of approximate um calculation that they were only getting one in 100,000 of the glucose molecules which makes a bit of sense because you know it well not you know um but they what what you could interpret is they're not extracting so efficiently all the glucose molecules. Now, what they would do is they'd actually do two readings over the course of 20 minutes. On one of the systems, they'd make a reading, and then on the other system, they'd make a uh, bit of a reading. And they would end up um, repeating that and averaging it. As I say, it could lead to a bit of um, soreness um, on the arm. Now, the fact that they were doing two readings and averaging it means that if you were in this kind of, um, your glucose was actually falling, you could end up... Um, taking a reading and on one of the electrodes it was eight millimolar but once you came to the other reading this person's glucose is genuinely falling and when you extracted it you actually ended up extracting something that was probably more like six and a half molar so the problem with this idea of taking two readings over 20 minutes is if that person's glucose is changing over that 20 minutes 
you're going to end up giving them a number which has got is elevated due to them being um, at a higher glucose approximately 10 minutes ago. So I did have a if if I kind of if I made up this idea about going from nine millimolar to six millimolar over 20 minutes, then you could end up telling somebody that they were actually 7.3 millimolar when in fact they were actually six millimolar, which means that you've got an error of 18 percent. Um, and when you read some of the reviews, you realize that one of the problems they did have was error. It wasn't just due to this, but I did make this comment at the very beginning that it's good to understand this stuff because we're ridiculous if we're, if we're let's say, repeating mistakes from the past. But the problem is that nobody can look back this far um, to actually realize this. So there's only a few of us who kind of either remember or have looked into it a little bit. Um, so this is some of the reviews they had. The warm up period is a problem. The itchiness was a problem. The inaccuracy was a problem. And, you know, some of these things are repet um, repeated. I did mention, you know, it may have been quite painful and some people have reviewed it was quite painful. I'm going to go to a slightly different watch this time. Even today, I, see, I do see people working on bioimpedance uh, for measuring glucose. I think this was first started, or at least an evidence of somebody doing this in a commercial way in 2003. They even got CE marked. Um, it's a company called Pendera, um, but they did have some problems with correlation. When I say correlation, one way of actually knowing how good your CGM is, is to have a CGM reading and test it against a blood glucose reading. So when they did that, they actually had a poor correlation. So a perfect correlation would be 100 percent. They had 35.1 percent. But they also um, there's something called the Clark error grid in um, glucose monitoring. And they did have what's called um, grid error ease, which are really a serious problem. You can have an error if that error doesn't really lead to any kind of um, harm to the patient, let's say, you know, that that's a one sort of error. But if the error can lead to a real harm to the patient, that's a real problem. So they did have about 5% of the time these real um, errors. I'm not going to talk about the Clark error grid today, but if you're not aware of it, then um, certainly um, go and look it up. But it just what I want to say on that is some errors. It's OK. It's interesting, actually, because sometimes people think that they need to be 99% um, accurate, 95% accurate. Um, for a in vitro diagnostic to be useful, sorry, for a point of care diagnostic to be useful, it actually only has to be 70% accurate. Don't jump on me on that, but that's actually the guidelines. Um, now people aim for higher. When you look at glucose meters, um, they are accurate to about plus or minus 15%. So just be careful about the accuracy you require. But there is a moment where actually you can be so grossly wrong, you can cause harm to the patient. So, you know, accuracy is important, but it's not it's not the 99 percent accuracy that sometimes people think that they otherwise um, need. Um, so Pendra were actually doing bioimpedance um, by their own emissions through looking it up. They were actually doing um, they were actually thinking they were measuring um, the sodium concentration and they were arguing that the sodium concentration was proportional to glucose. So this is really important see, because to be fair to um, Dex, uh, Dexcom and Abbott, their signal is due to the reaction of glucose oxidase with glucose. So that's very much a primary signal. You know, they're measuring almost directly the glucose. You could call it secondary because it's glucose reacting with the enzyme, um, which then produces hydrogen peroxide. But with this particular case, the further you are away from the true molecule that you're interested in measuring, then the, it really interferes with your accuracy. So Pendra, they had some electrodes on the back of the watch they were doing an impedance measurement um they were actually measuring what they think sodium um and they were trying to correlate the sodium with um with glucose anyone who's done an impedance measurement knows that you know temperature is a problem so they did actually have a problem with accuracy due to temperature and lo and behold sweat because effectively i think they're trying to measure you know impedance through the skin but of course if you've got sweat between your electrodes then that's the path of least resistance so they were nest up by sweat um and then i think perfusion characteristics so essentially if somebody was probably running around if somebody had high perfusion that was one type of let's say patient if you're a very sedentary patient and the, and your blood perfusion is very different that's a different type of patient they probably had algorithm problems with dealing with these two different types of people lo and behold they had movement artifacts so um and then i argue that in fact they, their signal was very tertiary what they were measuring was bioimpedance. What they were trying to do is correlate it with glucose. There's quite a gap between those two things. Um, and it's hard to be accurate when you've actually 
got such a gap between what you're measuring on and the thing that you think that you're correlated with. So they had a problem and they were removed from them. They removed themselves probably from the market. Apple have been, I'll just check the time. Yeah, oh, four minutes. All right, I'm going to go very quickly. Apple, um, small company out of Palo Alto in California. Um, they've actually been doing this since about 2010. Um, you can find kind of um, breadcrumbs of this over the air, over the, um, they bought a company called Rare Light in 2010 using um, absorption spectroscopy. They worked at Rockley Photonics for quite a few years. Um, at the moment, they're working with a semiconductor company called um, TMSC. When you hear about Taiwan and um, manufacturing of chips, TM, I think TMSC is the biggest foundry in the world. So Apple works with them at the moment. Um, if you read their patents, you'll find out that they actually they've got a watch. Um, they're probably using the LEDs on the watch as a source of, they would probably want to use them as a source of infrared. And then they've got a detector um, for that. Um, they're, I think, using the short wave and the medium wave infrared part of the spectrum. Um, the problem is that they, or the, at least what they're trying to achieve is to essentially illuminate um, the glucose through the skin. And they're looking at the signal that's kind of essentially reflected back or maybe it's transmitted. And um, the problem that they have is there's non-specificity of glucose in the infrared spectrum. They've got a problem of, of um, concentration. Um, Glucose is five millimolar. The molarity of water is 55 molar. So they sort of have 11,000 to one dilution problem. They've also got a quantum problem as well. There's lots of molecules that are good at absorbing um, infrared spectrums. Um, and I will dive into that. So they've got a specificity problem. This is the infrared spectrum for, um, this is the infrared spectrum for glucose. This is the infrared spectrum for water. So to be fair, water and glucose I would look very different at about 1000 wave numbers, but they're overlapping at about 3000 wave numbers. So water is a bit of an interference. This is a common drug. Um, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's very representative of a lot of molecules in the body. It actually has quite good infrared activity at about a thousand wave number. So water is your problem at 3000 wave numbers and lots of organic molecules, your problem at about 1000 wave numbers. Um, and when you overlap all these things, it's very hard to argue that glucose is um, has a distinct, let's say, absorption that's unique to glucose. I mean, glucose is just a carbohydrate. There's plenty of carbohydrates in the body. It's only got, you know, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Um, if you think about hemoglobin, uh, for example, it's got iron in the plus four oxidation state, you know, this bright red. Well, so, ox so hemoglobin pulse oximetry works really well because hemoglobin is very unique. Glucose is not. It's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It is boring. It's got nothing special about it. So they do have a bit of a problem when actually, you know, there's a lot of interfering molecules. Water alone is 11,000 times in excess of glucose. They also have a quantum problem that it's not unique that, you know, most organic molecules or most molecules actually have a, some sort of absorption in the infrared spectrum. I've done some back of the envelope calculations. I'm going quite quick because it's become up to the hour now. I did some back of the envelope calculations. I got a suspicion that their signal to... At best, their, their, their signal to noise ratio, their signal is one and their noise is about 2,750. So I think this is the problem. Now, don't forget, this is Apple. They've been working on this for a good 10 years and it's not on the market yet. And it's probably due to some of these um, back the envelope calculations that I've covered. Um, at ZP, we're much more interested in microneedles because it does what the FDA asks. You know, it breaks the skin and puts the sensor into um, place. So that's what we think is going to work. So in summary, I'm glad that you've got a bit of a deeper in insight into ZP. If you're interested in um, either potential stats or in vitro diagnostics, we have other webinars. Also, I keep saying in vitro diagnostics. I should say point of care diagnostics. We have other webinars that will cover that. I hope we've given you a bit of a deep dive and a history lesson, let's say, into um, CGMs today. And, you know, and also I've really touched upon invasive, which is where the technology is today minimally invasive where the technology is kind of going non-invasive which is one of the hardest places but you do have big billion dollar companies trying to do it and then implantable actually sensionics have done it um, but there's probably room for making um, it smaller i just want to say thank you if you've got any questions or zp don't hesitate to reach out to us um and um just want to say take care okay um thanks very much bye bye